Hey, this is Mike Matthews with MuscleLife.com and welcome to the podcast. Uh, in this episode, I'm going to do part two of the Q&A from uh, different readers. I set up a Google moderator, which I'll link down in the description below. If you're on you know, YouTube or if you're on the website here, you'll see it. Um, where you, you can go submit questions and then vote on other questions that people have submitted. Um, works basically like Reddit for questions. The, the more popular questions kind of rise to the top and the ones not so popular fall off. And I'm just going to be going through and, you know, spending 30, 40 minutes answering the, the popular questions and uh, just kind of keep it going. People like the last one. So um, I thought I'd do another one. So let's get to it, uh, starting with the first question. So the first question here is uh, by Alec Khan. And he or she says, hey, Mike, how many hours of sleep do you get per night? And what do you do to balance sleep with family time and working 60 plus uh, hours per week? Um, so my sleep, it's kind of, my sleep is randomly, I don't need a lot of sleep. And I've actually spoken to a couple doctors about it. Um, Dr. Lee from GeneSolve, who I had on the podcast a few weeks ago, um, I was curious what his opinion was because I rarely sleep more than six or six and a half hours a night. Um, sometimes on the weekend, although I've been getting up early to golf. <laughs> so I've been getting up, like I get up at about six 30, uh, on weekdays to go work out. So then on weekends I was getting up at six 30, uh, I was doing that to go golf. And now I've kind of switched it where I'm doing my work earlier in the day. And then I'm going to the golf course later in the day when it's empty and, uh, the weather's even a little bit better and whatever, but still, um, so maybe on the weekends now, maybe I sleep seven hours. I don't know, but, uh, I don't need much sleep and I don't really have that great of an explanation for it. Um, like I said, I mean, it's not a health issue. Uh, I've spoken to Dr. Lee and a couple other doctors just to get their opinion. And basically, uh, the, the general, like that general advice of sleeping eight, nine hours a night doesn't apply to everybody. Um, there was even some research recently that showed that certain people have a, a gene that allows them to get by with less sleep basically. So I haven't, I haven't had like gotten myself tested to see if I have that gene. Um, I would be a little bit surprised if I did have it because I wasn't, it wasn't always like this when I was younger, I'm 30 now. So when I was younger, uh, I remember needing more sleep. If I slept six hours, it would have felt like a zombie. Now I sleep six hours and I'm like fully ready to go. I can't even sleep more if I wanted to. Like I wake up after six hours of sleep and I'm now awake. If I go back, I mean, maybe if I sat there for 30 minutes, I could fall back asleep, but I don't, you know, I don't feel tired. I'm just ready to go. And I guess that's the important thing is, um, if you're not setting an alarm, how, how long do you sleep? That's generally how much sleep your body needs. Um, recently my son, he's been teething. So the, my sleep's even been a little bit less, but it hasn't really bothered me. I probably slept five hours last night. I uh, feel fine. When did my workout went up on my deadlifts? I'm happy. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. Um, I, I, I know that, you know, like, like my partner in Legion, Jeremy, he's tried to do my sleep schedule and he, he does it for two days and then he can't even think. So, uh, I think, you know, you got to find how much body, how much sleep your body needs. That's really what it boils down to. I actually wrote an article on sleep. I'll link it down below if you want to just check out a little bit more on this. Um, but I'm not even sure if you can just train your body to sleep less. Uh, a couple years ago, it just kind of happened randomly where I started waking up after about six, six and a half hours and just full of energy and not needing any more sleep. So I was like, well, I guess I don't need to sleep seven, eight hours anymore. So I'll just sleep six hours. And I love it because it gives me more time in the day. I'm able to get my workout done first thing in the morning early get to the office, do all my work and whatever. Whereas in the past, you know, if I was working out at night, um, also the gym is, is empty at, you know, I get there seven 15 ish or so, um, nobody there. So that's nice. Uh, so yeah, it's great for, for productivity per, you know, reasons. And, and also I like, you know, being able to get my workout done first thing in the morning, good start to the day. I feel energized and, you know, so there's that as well. Um, so yeah, I guess that's it on the, on, on the sleep and then balancing, you know, family time and working. Um, I mean, I do work a lot. Uh, you know, I actually wrote an article on this, which I'm going to link down below, but, um, kind of like the, the key points to it are, uh, in terms of finding a balance uh, for me are, uh, one, I don't take very much time for, well, I take very, very little time actually for just doing random things. Like I don't watch much TV. I usually watch one show at a time. My wife and I watch a little bit before we go to bed. 
And that's usually like where my recommendations on cool stuff, those are like, those are shows over the years that like if I'm watching one show at a time, then they, I kind of get through it and either I end up losing interest or, you know, make it through and then whatever. Um, and I don't, uh, my, I don't hang out with people during the week ever. Like I'm never at parties. I'm never hanging out at Starbucks. Uh, the, I kind of just, I follow a bit of a schedule and I find that's important. Well, I guess it's not a bit of a schedule. It's a pretty rigor, like a rigid schedule really where every day I'm waking up at a certain time and going to the gym at a certain time. <clears throat> I'm arriving here at the office at a certain time. My first couple hours are spent doing a certain type of work. And then my next couple hours are spent answering emails and my next couple hours are spent doing something else. And then I'm going home and then I'm eating from this time to this time. And then I'm spending my, now I have, you know, an hour to work on this and an hour to work on that. And now it's 1030 or, you know, uh, I usually get off, stop my, my work at about 1030 ish. Sometimes it's later to get ready for bed spend some time with my wife and, uh, you know, at dinner time, I spend some time with my wife and my kids. So for me, I guess, uh, balance is, uh, I, I just work a lot. There is no like real secret to it other than just, I don't need as much decompression time or whatever as some people, I guess. And a lot of that I think is just your own, how much, how much like, playtime you think you need i think is a, is is how much you're gonna feel you need i mean i've heard people say things like what uh i remember where i saw this but like someone was saying that they find like the 888 rule is the for happy living eight every day is eight hours of work eight hours of play <clears throat> eight hours of sleep i mean that's ridiculous to me eight hours of just dicking around every day that makes no sense to me i would be so bored uh you know, assuming that play is just like kind of inherently pointless activities, watching TV, I don't know, playing video games, stuff like that, that, <clears throat> I mean, I can do it in very short dosages, but I could never just do hours a day of just random kind of pointless activity. And that's, I don't know, that's just the way that I am. And in the future, I mean, I'm willing to, in the future, it might be different. It might be, uh, as, as my son gets older, I might be wanting to take more time, you know, if he's going to be playing sports and there's traveling involved in that and, you know, whatever. But I figure now is, uh, now is the time to, to work hard and set myself up financially. So maybe in the future, if I want to work less, I can. But for me, work is not something that I am looking forward to getting away from or something like that. I enjoy working and I, I don't know if that will ever really change uh, because it doesn't matter how much money I would have. I'm not, I'm not working to just hit a number. I'm not working to try to make a certain amount of money so I don't have to work anymore so I can go on awesome vacations. I can go on awesome vacations right now if I wanted to, but I don't because I just want to work. Um, so I don't, I don't really see that changing much. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, that, that's really it. And, and Sarah, my wife, is, is very good with, she understands and she doesn't uh, give me a lot of shit for, for how much I work. And I do try to keep in time and make sure that we're, you know, we, that we're spending time and Friday nights we go on a date and then Saturday, I take off Saturdays to do stuff with her and my son. And then Sunday is uh, I play some golf and then I just work. So I'm not really around on Sunday, but, um, yeah, I mean, we've worked it out between the two of us to a schedule that, um, allows us to, you know, still, keep our marriage together and still enjoy that. And, you know, also, uh, give me the time to do what I need to do to, um, you know, do what I'm doing with my work and all that. So I guess then that's kind of my rambling answer to that one. Okay. Let's go to the next question here. Chris from Boulder, Colorado, Mike, how have your goals changed as you become more successful with your books, blog, supplement range? Where do you see muscle for life in the next five, 10 and 20 years? Uh, that's a good question. Um, really honestly, my goals haven't changed they haven't changed so much. It's more become just what the possibilities have become more real, I guess, have kind of crystallized where, um, I, well, I'm in the very beginning. I mean, I published Bigger, Leaner, Stronger in January of 2012 with just, I, you know, I was just interested in seeing, really, I had been hearing things about Amazon's publishing platform, KDP, and heard that it was picking up and, you know, as a self-published author, you could actually sell some books. So I figured I'd just give it a go and see what it's like. Um, I didn't do, I mean, I didn't have any sort of marketing plan, nothing. I just wrote the book, put it online. I think it sold five copies the first month or 10 copies or something like that. And I was like, yeah, somebody bought it. Okay. And then the next month it was like 30 copies. Oh, wow. And then the next month it was 70 copies. And so there was a point like maybe by month six where I was selling a few hundred copies a month. 
and I was like actually saying, well, this, this could be something. So I'll start writing another book. And um, so in the beginning, I didn't really have, didn't have any big goal other than put a book online, see if anybody buys it and even likes it. And, you know, I was getting some emails and some reviews and people were liking what they were reading. Um, so that was in the beginning, kind of like, um, I'll probably write an article on this, a metaphor of uh, kind of kicking, uh, if you're up on a mountain, right, and you have a snowy mountain, kind of you kick the rock over to see if you can create a, a big, massive snowball. So you can get that momentum going that turns into something big as opposed to trying to make something big in the beginning. Just get something out there, get something, you know, kind of like the, the minimum viable product type of mentality and just see, does it have any life? Is there any possibility? Um, the, the quality, uh, well, I, I always try to do my best in terms of quality. Um, the quality of everything has improved and I'm always looking to improve. That's why I'm working on second editions of Bigger Than You're Stronger and Thinner Than You're Stronger because since publishing it, I've made some updates already just based on people's feedback and questions, but I was gathering a lot of uh, feedback and, and questions and just, you know, suggestions for clarifications and things over the course of the last um, eight, nine, ten months. And um, in anticipation of not like the principles of the books are the same, but I'm now just upgrading. I'm a better writer now. I've done a bit more research. Um, I'm going to be reorganizing the book. Just a, a lot of stuff that people had suggested to me. So I'm always kind of looking to improve quality going forward. But, you know, I knew that you don't have to have something perfect in the beginning. People are, are uh, you know, if they can see that you put effort into it and you're, tra and you're trying to be helpful and you put out a, a, a decent product, people are a lot more forgiving than you, know, than you might think. And I understand the wanting to be a perfectionist and wanting things to be, you know, trying to produce the, the ultimate product right off the bat. But um, in more cases, I, I see that failing more often than not. The, a lot of the successful business people that I know, and art, you know, that includes artists as well, they, they did, they started out with something, even even um, instances of, of where the beginning actually required a bit of time and a bit of work because the product being launched was actually a pretty sophisticated thing. But relatively speaking, it wasn't sophisticated compared to where it's at now. So it may have cost a couple hundred thousand dollars. Like I think of a, a friend of mine who he owns a company um, that they have like a whole automated software thing for car dealerships. Uh, to like schedule um, your your appointments and tell you when your car is ready and whatever. So I know he was quite a bit of money and time going into putting that there uh, because the, just getting a, a minimum viable, pro viable product there cost a lot of money and time. But now, I mean, now his company's huge and you know it's way more sophisticated now than it was. So um, <clears throat> yeah, in the beginning it was kind of just like, all right, I'm gonna put something out there that I'm gonna try to you know do my best, put up, put everything down that I knew at the time, and, and organize as best as I could, and see what people think. Uh, now rolling forward, of course, it's turned into this whole thing. There was no Muscle for Life at the time. There was no website. There was nothing. I didn't even have. I didn't even know a single person in the fitness industry. Uh, I just kind of got something out there. So now um, my goals. I so I guess as they have changed, of course, from the beginning. But once I started seeing it becoming something. The goal was, uh, I mean, I could see that in the distance, it's possible that this could become something big. I could build a website. There is a niche here. I can fulfill a need that other people, and I can do it in a way maybe better than a lot of the other people in this space. Um, so that, you know, that then was in the future, but I'm, uh, I don't get too fired up like now, you know, fast forward to to today and Muscle for Life is receiving over 800,000 visits a month and it's growing at a rate of 100 to 150,000 visits a month. That's, you know, so next month it's going to probably break the 900 mark and then it'll break the million mark and so forth. Legion's doing very well. So yeah, now if I look forward, I don't really like when I'm setting my personal goals, I don't sit and dwell on the, the real big picture that much. Um, I don't, you know, it's not like, oh, sure, Legion could become a $50 million, $100 million a year company. Yes, that's possible. Um, you know, is, is it probable? I don't know. But uh, 10 to $20 million is that that's like all I have to do is just keep going and it's it'll be there. Um, so when I'm looking at my goals, it's more just like, I my focus is on the present and what I'm doing to get there. And I don't focus too much on I don't, I don't I'm not like I don't I don't even want to talk about it like I'll say that to you guys and girls but I'm not like 
people that when they ask how how's my work going how are things going i'm not one to talk a lot about like oh well legion's gonna be a hundred million dollar your company and we're gonna sell it for all this money one day which i don't even know if i would do it really would depend on who would ever buy it and if they would continue it the way that i would want it to be continued and whatever but or or you know selling a million books or muscle for life this or that or whatever it's kind of just for me um, I even wrote an article on this uh, point, which I'll link down below on what I, on just uh, a, a more effective way to set goals and, and not to go around just talking about them. Um, so in terms of uh, what has changed, it was really just the change was seeing that there's a possibility and then seeing some of that possibility getting realized and pouring more into uh you know, seeing, okay, if I go more in that direction, uh, then it's going to, you know, get bigger. So I'm going to do that. Um, you know, it kind of reminds me of, uh, the, the book, uh, good to great, uh, which is, um, written by Jim Collins, a big, you know, very popular business book where, uh, basically you have a lot of these big companies that, uh, they were, they were, they were good at one point and they exploded and became huge and maintained it where one of the big things that they did is they focused on, uh, as they were growing, they were getting all these different opportunities to go in different directions, to diversify, buy into different markets and do different things. And they were turning down more way more opportunities than they would actually take because they wanted to stay focused on what worked for them. And they had their, their uh, f what, what Jim calls their hedgehog concept, which is something that they can be very good at, something that they're passionate about and something that makes money. And they had that very, very narrowly defined and they just focused on that and they ignored all the other distractions. Even if they were technically good opportunities, if it didn't fit within that narrow focus, they ignored it. So I've kind of applied that where my focus is on with Muscle for Life, uh, producing high quality content and uh, you know that, that I give away for free and interacting with everybody and actually being helpful and um, you know doing doing my due diligence on on the content and taking the time to do the research and also walking the walk like I, I'm you know I'm in good shape uh, I, I practice what I preach I lift heavy and um, you know I, I'm not one of these like flabby gurus that try to tell people how to lose fat um, so and then with Legion it's focusing on creating uh, high quality products that, where all ingredients are backed by, by valid scientific research that everyone can go review for themselves and, are, and all, our, all ingredients are included at clinically effective dosages, meaning the actual dosages used in, in clinical studies uh, and then naturally sweetened and just not full of all the artificial crap that we find in other products that can be harmful to our health. Uh, you know, if like in the case of artificial sweeteners, they may not be as bad as some people say, but more and more research is coming out that uh, regular consumption of these chemicals can, like there was a new study that just came out recently that showed that, uh, I believe it was sucralose, uh, it just alters the gut flora, which it can mess with uh, how your body, uh, how it deals with sugars and can cause different like cravings and problems with sugars. Um, and there was research that was, there was research that I saw about a year and a half ago uh, that showed the same in rats and now they showed it in humans. So, um, yeah, so that, that's kind of the focus with Legion. Instead of having, you know, 20 different products that we cycle through when people just get sick of and trying to do that constant product launch where we have the new product and then, you know, and then it dies off because, the, because it's crap, because it doesn't actually do anything, but people get excited to try it and then it runs out its life cycle of six, seven months and then it's gone and it's replaced by the next generation blah which is equally crappy. They just make a different, you know, make a different formulation and, and emphasize a different ingredient this time and just rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. Yeah, that makes money, but uh, it's, it's unethical. So, you know, it's just not how, and it's not necessary. I mean, I, I want to produce high quality products that are going to stay. I mean, the only thing I would like to do in the future is maybe as, because of economies of scale, as prices come down, for me in manufacturing, because my, my products cost quite a bit more to manufacture than, than you know, when, when a product has four times the effective ingredients as another, I mean, per serving, it costs more to manufacture. But as the manufacturing costs come down, the only thing I would like to do is we have some ideas on what we'd like to even add to some of the products when, when if, uh, you know, when, the, when we have some more room. Um, cause that's basically how we, how we do our research is when we're going to be producing a product, we kind of, we start with like the ultimate formulation. So for, you know, we just launched our multivitamin, our, uh, 
our first formulation was gonna cost us like $45 a bottle to produce. <laughs> or might have been more actually. It might have been closer to 60 a bottle actually. So that's where we start. We go, that would be the ultimate multivitamin if we could just have that. Oh, it's $60 a bottle for us. I, you know, if we were just to use a standard margin of 50%, if we were just to mark it up, you know, 100%, you know, which is, it would be, a, would be okay. I don't think people are gonna be buying $120 multivitamin. So we, then we have to work backwards. Then we have to go, okay, so find out which of these ingredients are really, really expensive. And some of them are, they just don't warrant the amount of money that it costs. You know, it might cost $7 a bottle to have this one molecule when you can use a different molecule that has very similar effects and it costs 50 cents a bottle. So, you know, there's, that's kind of the process of paring it down to what's the best possible product we can do given a high production budget, very high compared to other companies. So that's kind of like how, you know, I've been focusing on things, just pouring all my energy and time into the, the, this single narrow kind of like, uh, actions. And it's almost like a, uh, philosophy or ideology of, of how to, how to, you know, of, I guess, doing business. And, um, that's, that's how I kind of approach it. So going forward, you know, where do I see things in the future? Uh, you know, it's hard to say because I don't, there, there are things that I haven't been putting time into, which would be like networking. Like I don't, I'm not very well networked in this industry, despite kind of having probably one of the biggest fitness blogs. Uh, I don't know how many fitness blogs are out there doing a million visits a month, but there probably aren't that many. Um, and then in with Legion and whatever. So, you know, in, in the future, I definitely want to get more networked. Um, I want to do some PR stuff. Like I haven't really, I haven't tried to get into magazines. I haven't tried to get any real exposure. Anything that I've gotten has just been word of mouth. Um, so, you know, in the future, shit, I don't know. I mean, how, all I know is if I just keep doing what I'm doing, then I could make Muscle for Life the biggest fitness blog on the internet for sure. I mean, by the end of next year, you know, let's say it's 2 million visits a month or there's a point where if it just, you know, it's, and this growth has just been steady since the beginning. It launched in March of 2000, last year, March of 2013, and, and now it's already doing over 800,000 visits a month. So, um, but where, well, if I were, I mean, who knows what I would like to see, um, is I want to build out muscle for life into, I want to have a bunch of tools. I want it to be not just a source of information, but, a like where you can come to your meal planning, you can come to your workout planning. I'm building this app. I want that all integrated. It's almost like I want to build like a muscle for life ecosystem in a sense, um, where, you know, I guess you see that on other websites. Not that that's all that revolutionary, but I have some cool ideas that would make it a, a little bit different and, uh, offer some things that other, uh, you know, other companies or other websites aren't offering and, and that having it all linked together, this workout app is going to kick ass. And, um, so having that and then everything synced up on muscle for life and whatever that alone would be cool. Um, and, uh, just, you know, I, I enjoy the writing of it. So, I mean, that's kind of something I'll probably always see myself doing. Um, you know, obviously expanding the content with guest writers is it's fine. It's hard to find guest writers that I want to, put on the website, but I'm sure there are more out there. And uh, with Legion, I mean, yeah, it's just creating more products and, and getting into retail. I mean, we already have, we have GNC interested. Um, we have some other, some other retailers that are interested and some online bodybuilding.com is very interested right now. It's just, um, you know, we have to, we, we have to be careful to not over to expand essentially not take on too many commitments that we can't meet because of production times, because of capital requirements. Um, so right now we're kind of on a, f we're on a, f it's growing very quickly, but it's, uh, we're trying to manage it and, and not, uh, grow so quickly that, you know, we get into all kinds of production problems and which then can really hurt the brand image. I think people are probably, uh, because it's a new company, this is its first year in business and uh, run out of stock. I mean, if any, you've, if, if you've been following Legion at all, you know that. <laughs> And we, you know, we are switching manufacturers to a bigger manufacturer that can give us even better prices and give us faster turnaround times. So in that process of there, we like ran out of stock of everything because it took them longer than we thought to, to get the flavoring right and blah, blah, blah. Um, so 
uh, yeah, that's kind of like where we're at with Legion right now. And um, I mean, in the future, I would love to see Legion, not just because it's a financial thing, but I'd love to see, I'd love to see it getting very big, not, not just because it would make me a lot of money or sell a lot of products, but because of what Legion stands for in terms of the product quality and what we're doing with our formulations and, and naturally sweetening everything. Um, I think that those, it would be very cool to see that becoming more of a trend. Um, it's going to be hard. I don't know how some of these bigger companies exactly would do it. Like I can guarantee you no, no big company could produce Pulse with their current business model. It costs too much to make because the current business model is to spend very, very little uh, on the products themselves and pour tons of money into advertising and marketing and sponsoring all the bodybuilders and doing all that stuff to drive sales. It works, you know. The, the big supplement companies make tons of money and the margins are huge. And in some cases, the, the, staff, uh, the staffs are skeleton for how much money they're making. You'd be surprised. You have you know, a company doing $80 million a year with like five staff. Uh, it's, it's out there. So, um, but it would be cool to see, you know, at least, at least it'd be cool to see consumers a bit more educated and a bit more aware of what they're putting in their bodies and, and demanding things like the proprietary blend. Proprietary blend, blends just need to go away. They, it, it's only used for, for deception. That's something that I don't do with Legion. We're completely transparent with our formulations because we're proud of our formulations. Like the products sell themselves. If, if you look at our, our sales copy, it's quite a bit different than other companies. We don't, we're not like, we don't use hyperbole uh, and you know, big muscle pictures to, to, to sell products. It's, it's a much more, um, sober type of sales pitch based on research, based on, you know, there are this many grams of this in the product and here's what research shows that does. And that's why we've included this. And, you know, in some cases, for instance, in our multivitamin, we're including quite a bit more of the RDI on certain vitamins and minerals, and we explain why. Um, and then with all the additional ingredients, uh, you know, clinic, we talk about clinically effective ranges because, you know, you don't have, it could be a clinically effective dosage of something could range from, I don't know, let's say 100 milligrams to a gram. Um, but, you know, it might be that the lower end is used for fighting stress and anxiety and the upper end is used for, you know, um, some other, some other use for instance. And as we want the stress and anxiety effects, we're going with the lower end, maybe we use 200 milligrams. So, you know, I, we get into a lot of that and give details and assume that the customer, that you as the customer want to actually know what you're buying. You don't just want to be told you know, by, you know, we don't want to like see, uh, some mass, a couple massive bodybuilders doing curls and then just have some simple little text. So like, trust me, bro, this is the sickest multivitamin. This is, this is what you want. This is gonna make you build more muscle now. Like, you know, I hate that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's the way that, you know, we're going about it and it's really resonating with people. So, um, I guess that's kind of like where I see things going in the future. And as I said earlier, I mean, I'm always, I'm not looking forward to uh, being able to like not work. That's not my thing at all. So uh, the, the money that's made from it, you know, it's cool. Uh, financial security for my family and I like having nice stuff. So there's that, but it's not, uh, you know, I'm not one of those people that uh, I'm not very money motivated, I guess. And I'm not a greedy person either. So um, I don't see that changing. I'm trying to st just kind of stay, always kind of keep that uh, because also I don't like people like that. I, I just growing up, I've known quite a few people with money and I've known people that kids that came from money and there's certain, I, I really don't like when people get, uh, I guess it's just an arrogance thing when they get very, very arrogant because they've made money or because they're making money. And uh, so whatever. That's just something that I have kind of definitely told myself. I do not want to be like that person. I just want to be some dude who's doing some stuff. That's how I kind of look at myself. I do my, I do my work and it goes well. That's about it. So, uh, yeah, let's move to the next question. All right. So we'll do one more and then uh, I'll just continue. I mean, there's quite a bit more popular ones so that I can just continue in the next Q and A. So we'll just do one more here from, uh, this is a question from Ben from England. What did you do before becoming an author and why did it take you seven years for deciding to take the gym seriously? So before I was an author, I actually was working uh, in a company where I was building employee training programs for, for companies, uh, mainly healthcare professionals, very random. I know, um, there's a company actually I was in, I had with my dad and it's still going. I just 
I don't do anything with it now. My brother just takes care of it. It's kind of like a, a niche publishing company. So in a sense, I was kind of an author, actually. I, I was writing a lot of this training, and I would go to companies and meet with all their people and work out, uh, you know, had to interview people and build training programs and blah, blah, blah. Um, and before that, I worked in my dad's company. My dad has a company that sells energy. So I, I spent some time working there doing various things. Um, I didn't go to college because I, I, I graduated high school early. Um, I was 15 turning 16. I had, I had all my credits because I never took summer breaks. I just studied through summer and never even took spring breaks. All I did is just study. Um, so I had all my credits that I needed, uh, you know, here in Florida. That's just how it works. So I didn't, as I wasn't planning on going to college, I was like, well, I guess I don't need to, uh, you know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't need to take it anywhere beyond where I was at by the time I was 15 or 16, where I'd finished my, my high school curriculum uh, of the, it was a private school I was going to. And um, so, so I just got my diploma and then uh, started working in my dad's company at that time doing various things. Kind of, I just had to find what, I, what it is that I wanted to do and where, where my interests were. And that was a matter of um, studying different things and just doing different things. So I, and then I worked in a, a real estate company that was, uh, they actually never ended up doing it, but they were gonna build a whole hotel chain. They raised a bunch of money and uh, I was helping one of their project managers and learning that whole business um, and a couple other random things. And, uh, and then I, I really liked to read and study, so that's how I kind of originally got the idea. Maybe I would like to write. And originally my interest in writing was actually fiction to write, you know, storytelling, and, uh, which is still an interest of mine. It's still something I actually work on. Um, just I don't have much time to give it, but uh, it's something I kind of chip away on. In the future, that will be probably a bit more of a focus of mine. Um, but not right now, that, that's my indulgence, basically. My indulgence is like that kind of work. Um, and, you know, maybe I have like 45 minutes every other day to give it. But, uh, you know, I keep going on it and I will get something done on it next year. Next year, I'll have my at least a short story out and I have some ideas and whatever. Anyway, so that's how, that was my original interest in writing. And, um, and then, it, as I said earlier, it kind of the opportunity came with uh, publishing Bigger, Leaner, Stronger and just seeing how it went and seeing that that's, that's actually something I can do. So then I stopped, eventually I stopped doing the, the training company, just stopped working on it because it just, you know, my dad didn't care. He just wants whatever would be best for me is what, is what he wanted me to do. And he saw that there's a bigger opportunity in the fitness stuff. And it's also something that I, you know, I, I care about and I'm passionate about. So um, yeah, that's, that's basically that story. And uh, on the college thing, I mean, some people are surprised to, to learn that. Uh, you know, I figured that um, there wasn't a specific vocation that I was interested in. in, in I couldn't say, I want to do this, and that means that I have to go learn it in school. And getting, uh, one, I was like 16. I'm not going to college at 16 and just be the weird, awkward. I mean, so that wasn't even, you know, I would have been would have been later anyway. But uh, getting a getting a, a degree for general business is just the people that I spoke to and asking them about it um, my dad and then different people that he knows and a couple of them um, even even had degrees from Ivy League schools where they they basically said it's a waste of time like these were people you know that had MBAs and in some cases from some big schools and they're like don't even bother if you want to be an entrepreneur go be an entrepreneur if you want to go climb the corporate ladder then you know try to go in try to get into an ivy league school and get an mba basically what they said and i was like well i don't want to do the corporate thing i want to do my own thing They're like well then just go do your own thing and you're gonna be better off so i took their advice on it and um did a bit of traveling which was fun my wife is from germany we started dating when i was 17 turning 18 and um so that was that was a cool experience to uh, where I'd, I'd go there she would come here so you know went around did the whole traveling thing went around europe and so that was that's a fun experience that i definitely want my son and any future kids to have um so yeah i mean that's basically kind of how i came to where i'm at now and in terms of taking the gym seriously i actually took the gym i wouldn't say i mean i don't even know if i'd say i take it seriously now i put less time into the gym now than i did when in the beginning for my first six, seven years when I really, yeah, I made some gains, but not what you would expect from seven years. I'll link an article down below where you can kind of see my little story of that and, and what that got me. Um, but the, I mean, I was very consistent. I, I, would, I was in the gym on an average two hours a day, uh, four to f six days, no less than three days a week. Um, cardio, lifting, uh, you know, 
harder workouts, like in terms of perceived effort, harder workouts then than now. Uh, because when you do a lot of high rep stuff and drop sets and supersets and your everything's on fire, that is less comfortable to me than, you know, trying to squat 380 pounds or something like that, or trying to pull 500 pounds, something like that. Um, sure. I mean, the, you have the, the heavier weight feels harder, but it's a shorter duration of, di of discomfort, I guess. Um, so it wasn't so much that I didn't take it seriously. It was more that, um, I didn't. I mean, I guess the one thing I didn't take seriously is the education side. I didn't really get myself educated. I just kind of read magazines and did workouts and I had friends and we all just kind of, you know, did our thing. And at the time I didn't have a particular, like it wasn't even real to me that I could maybe look the way that I look now. Like I didn't really, I never, I didn't know anybody that was lean. Like I didn't know a single person under 10% body fat that lifted weights. I knew like a couple, you know, naturally skinny kids, but that was like the whole, well, you know, you're skinny with abs, who cares? It doesn't count kind of thing, right? So, I mean, I was never fat. I was probably like 16, 17% at the highest, which isn't lean. It's not fat. It's somewhere in the, you know, a bit fatter than athletic kind of, kind of look. And um, I was eating a lot of food though. So, you know, I was like on a permanent bulk, basically. Not, not I wasn't eating junk food. I just ate a lot of food. Like I, my lunch could be, uh, you know, a couple chicken breasts and like a pile of rice or something like that, or a pile of pasta. I would just kind of eat like, you know, I would eat a lot. And I, and I used to think I had to eat absurd amounts of protein. I used to think I'd eat like 400 grams of protein a day. So, uh, I thought my carbs, I thought I had to eat a lot more food than I actually had to eat. But, um, in terms of the educational side of things, yeah, I guess, uh, that was the, that was probably the main reason why I didn't really take it seriously was I didn't know that I could do much better, I guess, because I just wasn't exposed to it. And I enjoyed my workouts and I enjoyed hanging out with my friends. It just kind of worked. But then as I got a little bit older uh, and I started seeing some other people and being like, oh, wow, like I want to look like that. What is that guy doing? Um, then that's when I started to, to take it seriously from an educational, you know, standpoint and start actually learning how the body works and what, what, is going to get me to the, that type of look and, you know, what doesn't get me there and whatever. So, um, yeah, that was basically my, my experience. And that, that was about five years ago now, I guess, four or five years ago. when I really started to look at it and, uh, changing how I'm eating, changing how I'm working out. And again, you'll see in the article that I'm uh, linked, uh, that kind of tells the story, how my body has changed since. Um, so, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to cut it off there. Uh, I don't want to go too long on these. Uh, so if you, uh, you know, comment, let me know if you like this, if you want me to continue. Also, I will link to the Google moderator page down below. So you can go submit questions and you can go, uh, you can, it allows you to vote on other people's questions and stuff. And then if you like it, I'll just keep it going. You just make it an ongoing thing, do one every couple of weeks or something like that. Uh, so again, thanks for checking out the podcast. If you like it, just go ahead and, you know, subscribe. I come out with them every week or two. And you can also find them, find them on YouTube. And you can, of course, find me and all my work at uh, muscleforlife.com. Thanks again and see you next time.